we're recording. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Distresa Lecture Series. My name is Puck Curtis, and I'm here with my co-host, uh, Eric Myers. And tonight, our guest is Daniel Hambreus. He is a rapier instructor and uh, president of the Umea Historica Faxoscola. Oh, my goodness. I asked you how to pronounce your name, but you didn't give me any help on that one. Did I say your name close? Daniel, I think you're muted. Can you can you yeah. say the name of your? Uh, the name the name was, was very good, but yeah, you completely fucked up the name. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, we'll just imagine that I said that in a very professional way. Um, his teaching is focused uh, around Rada's Destreza, and he began fencing in 2003 with Epe in modern Olympic style fencing. Uh, he competed at a regional level, winning regional championships multiple times. Um, then moving up to national competition, he fenced with moderate success. Um, finding that his club had no teacher, in 2015, he began to seriously focus on the art and took on the role of instructor. And then a year later, in 2016, he was introduced to uh, historical European martial arts and started doing long sword. Um, in 2017, he became the president and rapier instructor at the club, uh, which I will not repeat the name of. He was teaching Destreza after that, having read Thibaut um, and being taught the basics of Rada by Ailesh Vasulias uh, Vindrel via electronic correspondence. In 2018 and 2019, Ailesh visited the club to assist with their study of Rada. And in 2019, uh, Daniel visited and trained under uh, Maestro Tonpue in uh, Coruña. He is the creator of the Rada Explained series of YouTube tutorials, and he's going to speak to us about the process of making videos of this kind and what he's learned on his journey. So I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me share my slides. Are you showing now? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so, I'm Daniel Ambreus, just as, as Pak has introduced me. Uh, let's see, uh, I need to start the presentation. There. It still shows? Okay. It does. Okay. So I, I just want to comment on your opening slide here that um, all of these are custom graphics. So uh, you've got a really polished design. I hope you're going to talk a little bit about creating uh, sort of that look um, as you go through it. Yeah, uh, I can I can explain the secret behind it. Okay. Uh, you, should get, you should get married to an artist. <laughs> I got married that's, to that's a PhD nice research scholar. I I don't know what I did. Yeah. So yeah, it's 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 my fiance. She's she's making most most of my art. So it, it's very helpful making videos that I can have have an artist that does it for me. Uh, so how did I get into the stress? Uh, when I, I don't remember exactly how, but I think I was on Reddit and I was probably complaining about something uh, pretty loudly. And I complained about HEMA footwork because I come from sport fencing and my focus in sport fencing has always been footwork. It's something I've been working on a lot and I've been drilling it a lot. And it's, it's always been my, one of my core focuses. And I want to make smooth footwork. I want to make fast footwork and I wanted to make the footwork be the core of the whole fencing. So, so. And I and I sometimes talk without thinking, and I was probably complaining about footwork in some way. So Alesh, the Rada missionary, came to me with 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 Rada's footwork drills, which to me just looked brilliant because I, I looking from the perspective of of sport fencing, everything is linearly, and and I mean that's what made sense to me. But all these drills and how, uh, I mean, I could see, make sense of everything. I could I could see why it was doing it, 
like it made sense the drills the bit in, in how I explained them but it was something completely new so, so he immediately hooked me up and and then like a few few weeks later I was like hmm maybe I should try this rapier thing and ask asked again and voila there it pops up again this Alesh guy who seems to be in all the reddit threads and then he started he started talking about Rada again. So so he, he really got me hooked in, into Destreza. And yeah. Uh, and that's how I started. I I did, I can't I still can't read Spanish fully. I mean I I I visited Don and not all not all people there in Spain talk talk English very well. So I did attempt to communicate in Spanish, but my Spanish is horrible. I can't I can't say much more than my cat is black, and that's roughly my level of Spanish. And I will probably fail grammatically to, to, with, with the gender of my cat somewhere in there. Uh, but when I was starting, I mean, it, it was through Alish and his explanation of Rada, and that's how, how, how it really got started. But at the same time, I wanted to read something myself, so I bought and, re and read through Thibault because it was it was one of the few few things that was available in English, uh, and and that gets me into why I wanted to make a, a YouTube series because my route to learning the stress was not an easy one. I think I think it was I was extremely lucky to meet someone that could explain things to me through through, through the internet because it is like nothing. I think it's. Probably, I think the closest club that even does anything close to the stress is, is is in Copenhagen, and that's like a thousand miles away from here or something. And they do, and, and Vicky there does Thibault. Uh, so, so I, I wanted people that came after me to to. It have an easier time. I mean, I'm, I'm not a master. I'm not a master in this. I mean, uh, I do my best and I've been learning this, but I, there, there's lots of people that are, that are better than me at this, at this thing. I, I'm, I'm just a student, and, but, but I had learned something along, the, my, my, along my way. And even if, it, if in the beginning it was just a little bit on, a help, help on, on, along the road, I, I thought if, if if I can share what I have learned so far, maybe someone else will have an easier way to get into the stress for themselves. I mean, it's, it won't be perfect because I'm not perfect and I, I'm not not a master. But but just something to push them along a little, little bit. So I have a question about this. Um, you said that you read uh, Thibaut because it was in English. Yes. Um, and you're making videos in English. Yes. But you're you're not a native English speaker, so um, is your perception that English forms a sort of lingua franca for um, HEMA practitioners in the world? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think English is is I mean it's this it's my second language, but in Sweden we speak English from very early age, and I've been around English communities my whole life. So. I, I, it, it's it's just the, the language I'm most comfortable using for for this sort of things. I mean, I could make it in Swedish, but that that would be kind of pointless, I think, because the Swedish Swedish community is not a very large one. And even but, if maybe maybe it's the Norwegians and the Danish could maybe use it as well, like, it's just too small an audience. Your English is really really good. I have no trouble understanding you at all. Good good, uh, because it's something I've been practicing on because making videos to really uh, try to iron out as much of my uh, accent of it as possible. I still have, I still have some faults, but it's, it's getting there. It's getting there one day. Uh, so the, the whole point of my, back to the topic, the, back, uh, the whole point of my, my, my series was mostly to explain to new people to get into, into the stressor. Uh, and and the, the the biggest thing you, you you will be thinking when you're making a video series is a video series is a, a one moment in time. And especially, I started making it quite early in my career as diestro. 
So my interpretations will obviously change. It's it's inevitable. Uh, but I don't think it's a problem because while some things will change, some other parts will not. And even if even if if parts are wrong, you can just go back and change it. You can fix it. It's it, it doesn't have to be wrong or whatever in forever. And 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 I think I think this is important when when making videos. I think you shouldn't worry so much about all the details. Just do your best what you have what, with what you have and try to make something. I mean, when I started making videos. There wasn't that many other people who made videos. I mean, Ton had some videos. It was really good. I mean, that was one of the other other materials I had when I started. I was looking at Ton's videos, but it's like eight videos of him showing a puzzle and, and some follow ups from it, from the perspective of Rada. It's, it, they were great, but not enough. And I think yeah. Daniel, uh, do you uh, <clears throat> do you watch your own videos? Do you use them as feedback? Uh, no, not really. Um, I, I do show them to my students and I encourage my students to watch them, but I don't really use them myself. Uh, but making them is, is, is teaching me quite a lot as well. Uh, it's for each video I made, I had to make a deep dive in the topic I'm talking about. So I felt like explaining stuff really helped me learning as well. So some a few examples of, of, of how my interpretation has changed quite a lot. Uh, in the beginning, I mean, much of the footwork is, it was quite awkward for me from the beginning of, of doing the stressa. Uh, my initial footwork, based on Radha's drills, became something circular. But it, it was quite awkward in that it didn't have I didn't use any momentum. I was not used to using momentum. Uh, this is this is a there are things that use momentum in sport fencing. Uh, but in general, you, you try to kill the momentum with each step you make, you kill the momentum so you can change direction like as, as soon as possible. You're not really working with the momentum because it doesn't really make sense because the momentum is you, you're either moving forward or backwards. So it's, it's not really any other direction to move in. While when you're moving on the circle, uh, the momentum matters a lot. And you can transform the direction your body is moving in instead of just forward and back. Because when you're moving forward and back, you have to kill your momentum completely to, to move the opposite direction. While if I'm moving forward, I can uh, change the direction of my momentum to the right or to the left quite easily without really having to kill it. And, and this was something I struggled with in the beginning. So, so especially in my early videos, I think this is like one of the major things that have changed for me. And, and it shows in my earlier videos when I try to explain like basic footwork and basic, basic body mechanics. And my interpretations were simply too shallow on, on the topic. So, uh, it, it, it doesn't reflect how I'm thinking right now. Uh, and, this was, and, and this was like the, one of the major things I learned by studying under Tom a bit. This was like the biggest thing he was pointing at. Like, yeah, you, you need to work on this. Uh, the second thing is is very tied into the into this, and this is how I inter interpret that you should you do it. And this is with the, the crossing step, cross crossover, crossing over steps, and and pivoting, and there was simply no space for it in, in my earlier works. And I think it's such a big part of my fencing right now that it's also missing. Uh, and lastly, this is all, all of these are very, very tied together. Uh, and, and it's the importance of, of a, a continuous motion on, on the circle. If each step kind of kills your momentum, you can't have that. And without a continual motion that you can transform, you don't have any momentum to work with. Uh, 
and I right now think it's one of the core principles you are working with is, is your body, your momentum, your body, and also the momentum of the sword. But the momentum of the sword, I think I had a bit more on, but but in the body's momentum, I didn't have it. So so all of these are, are side effects of it. And, and that's the problem when, when you have an interpretation, it's that if, if the fault is very, very low level, uh, everything that's based on it will also be affected by it. And, and this was a very, very fundamental issue in my fencing and my interpretation. So, so it, it, it spirals out and touches almost everything. Daniel, could you um, describe a little bit more what you mean by pivoting there, please? Uh, with pivoting, I mean you're rotating around one of your feet, usually on your heel on, or on your toes, as a way to turning the direction of your movements. Are you thinking of this more as uh, as like the person in the center of Rada's drills, the one who's being attacked, or are you thinking about this more from the perspective of of uh, the attacker? Uh, in in Rada's drills, I think it's generally the person who's does the attacking, who's walking the circle. Okay. Uh, like the simplest one is is his he has is as I call it his attacking step because it's I think it's a uh, Transversal step into a um, uh, mixed extraño and I don't remember what what are the offline steps called. I don't remember. Uh, but he, he does that one every time, like a diagonal step forward and a diagonal step backwards. Mm. So in the diagonal step forward, I step with the foot along along uh, the direction. My foot is in the direction of what I'm stepping. I'm stepping diagonally. Then I place my heel and and I, I pivot on my my heel. Towards the direction I'm leaving at, which is even further to the to the to the direction I was moving in. So so my foot is making a 45 turn after I placed it. So you're not when you take that initial step, you're not uh, pointing the toe towards your opponent. You're pointing it along the line of, uh, that you're moving. Yes. Okay. And then after I, after when I'm retreating, I'm pointing towards my opponent again. Okay. Thanks. And, and this was what I did what earlier. My early interpretation was that I was supposed to place my foot uh, like I was leaving, which was directed towards my opponent. Uh, but it gets a bit awkward when, especially when you increase the speed of things and the momentum in your body, it, be, it kind of becomes kind of painful for the knee. I notice now, so now I pretty much always does that. Uh, so, so. Before, before I'm getting into like details of, of my process of making videos, is some general advice. And the biggest one, this, this, is, a, this is an advice I got from another vid content maker, and it's perfection is the enemy of, the, enemy of good. And it means that if, if you try to make the perfect video, you will never make a video ever, because there is no perfect video. There is always something that's wrong with it, always. You, you, you're gonna find, find some small detail there, maybe maybe this is to look a bit ugly here, or oh, maybe, maybe this clip wasn't perfect, oh yeah, yeah, it did stutter once there and when I was recording the audio and then I made a new audio, oh yeah, now the script kind of sucks like here and there, and you, you will always find details you, 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 you want to fix and, and make better, so don't try to make it perfect, so yeah, just make something, because the thing is, Eventually, if, I mean, when you start out, especially, it, it won't be good. It doesn't matter how, how much time you spend doing this. Your first video is going to be shit. This is, that's how it is. And my first video was shit. And, in, and if I look back at that video, it's, it's horrible. It's like problems in it all over the place. That, that I now know how it's better, to, can be done better. Like the lighting is, is really, really, really bad. I cut it really awful it's like sharp cuts all, all, all over the place um, i'm not in focus my cats are, are having a wrestling match in the background uh, it's the camera is off center the script is bad like there's all sorts of problems but the only way for me to get to the level of actually knowing all that, that that all of those things are bad that i can that i can do better is by having made that video it was a step along the way to, to for me to 
become proficient in making videos. So, so the first thing I think every content maker should do is just, just start, start doing, make, make videos. It doesn't matter if they're crap. Just, come, just make more videos. They will stop being crap eventually. And some of those videos will probably be really good, especially if you make lots of them. The, the, the other thing is you can barely plan too much. Especially the first phases, because uh, everything takes more time the further into the production you are. This is like a general advice that you will hear from from everything that any any type of work like uh, I'm a programmer, so so programming. The further into the production you are of it, the harder it will be to change. Like the first steps when you're planning and thinking, those are the steps when you can change the most. It, it's it's really really easy. It's just it's, it's it's just some text or some numbers, but you can you can change them. It's it's incredibly easy. So if you plan at that step, and and really think this through, like this, what what do I want? Do I, I, and then you can go through all the details and like place everything there. If you can, if you can do that, it it's, it's, it will be fine. But if, if if you're a bit sloppy and and fast in the beginning, and then you realize halfway through the production that you made a, a huge error, it, it's going to be extremely costly for you to change it. While if you change it in the beginning, it, it it it's 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 a nothing. It's a zero in cost, more or less. And this also ties into the next thing. You really need to know what you want to do before you start doing it. Don't start doing anything before you actually know what you want to do. So when I started making videos, I wanted to make an in-depth tutorial, step-by-step -step for Rada. That was what I was wanted to, wanted to make. I mean, it may be a bit arrogant of me to, to do that after not having done Rada that long, but I knew something and I wanted to convey that. And uh, the way I did sport fencing, I, I was a very meticulous person. I uh, I'm on the autism spectrum, and generally what it means for me is uh, I struggle with motor, motor learning. It's, 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 it's something that takes very, very long time for me to learn. Uh, I've always struggled with it my whole life, and even when I was younger, I had, I had issues, walk, some issues walking, and I was made fun of how I was walking, even, even like when I was as old as like 12, 13, something like that. So, so I've been very, very focused on, I, I need lots and lots and lots of repetition. And, and that, that's how, how I solved it, because I, I suck at learning things. My, my body sucks, sucks at learning, my, my head doesn't. I really learn things very fast, but my mind learns very fast and my body learns very, very slow. That means that I need to drill a lot. I need to spend lots and lots of time to doing this. And I need to break things down into details because I, I, I really str I can't learn by rote either. I need to understand. That's the only way I can learn. I'm, I'm a horrible student. I mean, it's, it's really, really hard to teach me. I, I learn pretty fast, but it's, it's extremely hard to teach me because I have a, quite a particular way of thinking and I need to understand things. And it, if, it, if I don't understand something, I will not learn it. I, I can't so go do it like this. It doesn't work for me. Can we drill down into that a little bit? Because I, I really sure. appreciate you sharing uh, your personal experience on that. And I want to ask you, like, as an instructor, what are the things that have helped you? Like, what are, what are strategies that work uh, for your learning style? And what are strategies that, that make it more difficult? The best for me, if someone is teaching me, is them explaining things. Like, I, I want everything explained for me. In, in very deep details as well. Uh, and I also need lots of time drilling. Really, really lots of time drilling. Uh, so, so the things that are hard for me is, is if, if I'm forced to make some a new movement that I'm not used to at all, if I haven't drilled a, a movement. So if I'm forced to make new motions, that would be a big problem. If I try to do something without understanding it, it would be a problem. But if, if instead I get lots of time doing fundamental drilling, it's, it, it works fine. 
if I get lots of time, if I get explanations so I, have some, so I can understand it and break it down myself, it also works fine. And, and that's generally how I approach fencing, both in sport fencing and then in distress as well. I needed to break things down completely for myself, first and foremost, but then since I was doing it, that was how, how I explained things. I needed to break things down. And, and that's what I wanted want, what I wanted to do with my videos. But if someone else is making something completely different, it doesn't matter. They just need to know what they want to do. That's the key takeaway. And have a really clear goal as, as well. I mean, that, that's kind of similar thing. But it's, it's very important that you really, really know what, what is the goal of what I'm doing. So don't start like doing random shit. You need to really know what's, what's the goal of this. So this is my process of making a video. I pick a topic, I research and write the script. Then I make a, 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 I record the audio to create a frame. Then I make the clips and animations and then the final edits. This is, and I'm going to go into details more on each step. So picking the topic is each, like the topic of each video I'm making. Uh, and this is, it's, it's good to have a general plan in mind, like the, like a, this, a strategic plan, like not just this video, but what, 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 what are my next five, eight, 10 videos are going to be about? I mean, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's going to be exactly that, just that you have some sort of plan in uh, plan ahead in mind then you can work towards that i mean if you have to change it that's fine it, it's, it's completely fine to change things so like in my initial plan the, the thing i wanted to do the most it was to make a video about the tahoe because that was like oh yeah this is, seems like the core of this fencing i didn't want to talk about the tahoe there is very little information about the tahoe i felt so i want to talk about the tahoe i still haven't made a video about the tahoe and i've been making videos one and a half years now so well maybe someday i'll finally get to make that video about the tahoe uh, but i felt that before starting talking about the tahoe i started i needed to talk about everything that's required to make the tahoe work and this is like the approach radat has it takes as well he, he's, he doesn't start with the tahoe he says don't start with the tahoe start to start with the footwork start with the blade work start with the combination of the footwork and the blade work and then, and then his whole fencing is is standing and falling with the Tahoe, and he still doesn't introduce it in the beginning, because it requires other things. And this is also how, how I approach it in my videos. I, I felt okay. I need to explain like I need to introduce this. I need to explain like a bunch of theoretical things before I feel even comfortable tackling the Tahoe. And I, I, I think I need to talk about the footwork first, because I, I need footwork for that Tahoe. I need blade work for that Tahoe. And, and when picking a topic, it's important that, that's that you have just some sort of, 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 of plan that you have, a plan that you have having for the future. It doesn't need to be a perfect plan. Plans can always change, but having a plan helps. Because that helps you put the order of things, order of the videos you're going to make. I'm, I'm making a, 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 a series of tutorials, and the order of things are very, very important in that. The, the goal of my series has always been as, as a lasting monument, more or less. I want it to be a, a series that people will be able to watch like years in the future. I mean, I don't think the quality holds up right now for, for the earlier videos. And I, I'm planning to go back and redo them with better quality and fix, fix issues in them. But I, I still have a plan of this is the order I want to introduce these topics in. And it's also important that you have some passion about the topic. It's, if, if I'm doing something, I need to be, I need to have the energy in it. And it's it's hard for me to do a video about something that I don't really care about. And 
and it's if you get into something, I feel that it's fairly easy to get passionate about it. If you if you, if you start diving into it, you, you will feel passionate about it. But if if you don't care about something, it will be really hard making a good video about it. It, you, it will be hard to make to to do justice for the topic. And it's also important that it's a topic that you can actually feel you can teach someone about. And and for me, I think this this was simple because, I mean, the people I've always been imagining is the people that that doesn't have any teachers nearby. I mean, I don't have any teachers nearby when I started, and I it's 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 for for another me that's coming in the future. It's for the, that person I imagine I'm teaching because when I'm starting, I knew nothing, and and it's. And it, it's not for the people that actually have a, a available good as a teachers. It's not for the people that can actually read the books. It's not those I, I really aim the series at when I'm sort of making it. I made them for someone. Okay, I, I don't have I can't read these books. I don't have access to these books, but I'm still interested in this. I want to learn this. So, so those were, were the people I was having in mind when I was starting making this this series, and those were the people I felt I could teach something at least. So the biggest chunk of work is is in the in writing the script. Actually, this this is like the most time consuming part of of the whole work. This is where all the planning goes in. This is where uh, this is where I spend my most time. And generally, when I, when I write my script, this is this is one of my uh, I think it's my second latest video from it. The script from it, and and this is how I generally structure my script. I, I color coded, so the yellow part means it's a talking head segment. That's in introduction, and I and and I and I write the script in detail because and this is important. When you're writing a script, it's very very important to write a script. I think because if, at least if you're making a tutorial, you don't want to babble. Babbling is extremely boring. No one wants to listen to you babble on about random shit. They want they want to listen to you about the topic at hand. And the, the best way to ensure that you have, have a very short and succinct, succinct uh, video is that you write a script and that you follow the script. So the yellow parts here are, are the talking head segments. Uh, the dark blue is, is part of the splash. This is like a splash screen. And the uh, uh, light blue purplish color is for the is for segments that I'm gonna create a clip for, and and there is also other colors for like animations and some other stuff as well. I don't remember all the colors I'm using, but this is just a way for me to structure structure it. I have a question for you about this structure. Yeah. So you've got that broken up into different colors. Do you um, try to record that all in one shot, or do you do different audio files and then stitch it together? Uh, I make separate audio files. I try to make it, each of those, uh, but I'm going to get into a bit more details later uh, about um, sure. about the, about the clips and that part. Hard. And when writing a script, it's important that it's uh, it's 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 not written text. This is a uh, spoken text, so it needs to flow when being read. This is something I struggled with when I was starting. That I I I was writing it like I was writing a large comment on 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 Facebook, or if I was like in a novel or something. It it looked nice, but it was horrible for me to read. Uh, and it needs to have a, a good flow when it's being read. And and the the, the whole reason why I'm why even writing a script in the first place. Is that it's short and snappy. You, you want to minimize the amount of words as much as possible. I mean, you can use a bit flowery language and jokes and stuff, but you, you, you don't want to make long tangents about ra random things that are not related to the topic at hand. You want it to be as short as possible. And, and, and it, it, that's the whole purpose of the script. So make sure that your script actually is that if you write one. And this is also the time for researching. This is the time when you can look things up. This is the time where you can talk to other people. This is the time when you can read the books and, and do all that sort of stuff. 
once the production has already started, you, you can't really change things. So, so now is is when when you should when you should put time in into in, into into researching things, because there is, there is no other time to do it. And this is why it's also the most time. This is probably one of the most time consuming parts because this is the part where I have, where I really dive deep into things. This is this is when I really really read things and generally. Uh, but it is meant is, is talking a lot to Alex because he's the one that actually can read Rada for me. I mean, now I can read Rada because Alan has started translating it. But before that, the, the, the research part was mostly talking to Alex. But, but it was still very, very time consuming because it took lots of time to think about like, how do I want to talk about this and really diving into the topics. There. Oh, well. uh, I try to make a frame, and with that I mean uh, I make the audio to make a framework for for everything else in my videos. So so I record all the audios as separate files, and all all the talking head segments. This is like the first thing I do in the video. I I don't really make any time timing or anything like that in, at this part of it. At this part, I only try to record them. I have the script ready, and then I read from the script. Uh, if it's a talking head segment, that means that I'm talking to the camera. Or in, in, if, if it's not one, I'm, I'm just reading directly from the paper. This means that the talking head segments are extremely time consuming in comparison, because I usually need like one take. Some, sometimes I take two takes when I'm reading from the paper directly. And I can make much longer takes with, with no problem. While, while I'm talking, while I'm a talking head, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an actor. I'm really not an actor. I've never done any acting my whole life. But I'm, but, but reading a script means I need to be an actor, and it's something that's very very difficult for me. And it usually takes me around. If I include the practice, then it's like twenty to thirty takes. But if it's like only the real takes, it's like 10 usually for, for each talking head segment. So, so it's, it's quite time consuming to make talking head parts. So I, I want to keep them as short as possible, first of all, and try to make them into clips, shorter clips, that naturally becomes cuts as well. And after I made all the audio clips and talking head parts, I will cut them together and, and then I will have the frame for the video. Then I will know how long each that or each of the other segments will be. I will know like how, how much filler content do I need for, for the parts where I'm talking. The talk is always the, 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 the focus of, of, of my videos, me explaining stuff. And, and then the video and the text and whatever else I put on the screen is, is there to help that. that. That's like my perspective of making the videos. And when I'm a talking head, what I think is important is that, because talking head segments are incredibly boring, they're super boring. Listening, listening to some random person talking to, to, their, to their camera, it's not, it's not the most interesting thing. The, the thing that makes it interesting is the content content and and you can make it more interesting also by being by being an interesting person to listen to if you want to convey your passion you really need to really need to like grab your your passion from within and really push it out as a talking head i'm i'm, I'm i can be i mean i'm a pretty low low key person often but i'm also i mean that's my I have two sides either. Either I'm extremely laid back, barely talking, barely interested, I mean, barely blank, or I'm really, really into something. Really, really, really. There is like very little in between. So when I'm making these talking head segments, I really, really try to tap into that. I really need to tap into my, my passion. And, and I don't want the talking head segments to be boring. 
So I try to make them interesting with my with my energy at least. I, I try to, to push as much of that into into these these segments. I, I keep them short, but I also try to push my energy in them and do as many takes as you need. I mean. Don't focus too, too much on all the small details, like don't try to make it perfect, as I've said earlier, but do take your time. If, if, you, if you fuck up, you fuck up. Do another take. Maybe it takes 10 takes, 20 takes, 30 takes, it doesn't matter. Just, just do it. It's, it. This is not the most time consuming part. It, it's one of the most exhausting parts, but, but it doesn't, it's not the most time consuming. It doesn't take that long to make, a, make like a clip. It's like each of my clips are like, 10 seconds. I mean, it doesn't take take that long to do one one of those. Maybe I have to re redo it and like read the text again. And but even then, it's like a minute per take. If if I do 30 takes, it's like a 30 minutes. It's it's not very much, not compared to how long it takes. And it's usually not 30 30 minutes per take per talking head segment. I think it's like yeah, something maybe 15 to 30 minutes. I think it takes to make a a, a decent. Talking head segment, and I, I, can, I can do most most of the audio and the talking head segments in an evening. It's not a problem. It's the research that takes takes can takes a few weeks. So so yes, take your time with it. It's, it's, this is not where the, where your where, where most of your time will go anyway. So to really take your time to make to do it right, and 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 then be happy with, when it's good enough. It doesn't need to be perfect. Perfect, just good enough. Like, uh, if I pronounce things wrong, like completely botch something, or if I forget the script, if I stutter a lot or something like that, then then, then I redo it. If, if it's like a small thing, like a small stutter, maybe I mispronounce it, by then but then pronounce it correctly immediately afterwards. Maybe sure, let, I let it slide. And as I've been talking about, the audio-only recordings are much easier. And and I have, an, I have a guy at my club who's trying to make this video as well, and he has come to realize this as well. It's much, 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 much easier to do an audio-only recording, especially if you work from a script, because you can just read it. So, I mean, I, I can I can read in I can read uh, like loud loud reading. I can do it. Uh, Full speed from while while read, reading and talking at the same time. It's it's not a problem. I think it's it. I don't think that's that's a very uncommon skill either. I think most people should, can can be can be able to to do that. So I don't need to remember any lines or anything like that. But if, while I'm doing the talking head segments, it's important where I'm where I'm looking. I need to look at certain places. I can't be reading. My eyes can't be doing that. It, it would be sh show up in the video. So, so I need to remember the lines and I need to deliver them properly while, while, while the camera is looking at me. So, so as much as possible, I think you should try to avoid talking head segments because they, they too also are, are not that interesting. Usually people find it more interesting to look at, at, a, at, a, at like a clip of you doing, doing the thing at the same time or or, or a picture or something else. So, so try to avoid the talking head segments as much as possible. And it, when you have them, try to keep them as short as possible. And, and it's really important that you really plan which images you need as well. Uh, and I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not the one doing most of my images. It, it's, it's my fiance who makes them. Uh, but it's important you plan them. And, and I usually do it not during the scripting part, but it's usually around the, when I'm making the frame, I will notice exactly. I mean, I had uh, I had the, the blue parts in, in the script was the parts I had for images and splash screens. And I, I usually create the splash screens myself, but the images I use for in them, it's, it's, it's my fiance who makes them. And, and this, this is like, uh, I'm using Vegas, and this is like how it looks after I made my framework. So, so you can see the, the upper, upper ones are the talking head segments and, my, and the intro as well. Uh, and the bottom part is the audio only parts. 
So here I can see exactly how 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 long each of these clips will be. How long how long for how long will I be talking? And you can also see my naming conventions, which is it is just for for ordering it doesn't matter that much. Uh, but but with this I can then figure out everything else and then I can write down like exact timing if I'm doing animations. It, it will, which I will get into later, it's important to have very exact timings. Uh, but but even for the clips, I also need to know like at least roughly how long they are because it, usually it's in the cutting part when I'm having like clips of me doing fencing or my students. So from that, I can then like this is this is uh, like all yeah not all of the clips but. Met most of the clips I I needed for a um, for a video, and I could figure it out from the previous video, like roughly how many clips do I need for each. So some of them have two, some of them have four, some of them have only a single one because it's was a very very short part. And this I can like figure out roughly. From the previous one, when I can see, I can, I can take the times. Like, oh yeah, this is this is roughly how how long it is, and, and then I need like roughly this many clips. And this also depends, like how complicated it is, uh, how many sides I need for it. And and when I'm making the clips, I'm doing it with my students. I'm not doing it alone. I I I have need to have someone to do it with usually. Since I'm taking up someone else's time, but it's very very important that I know exactly what I want. That's what I had the, the previous one. That, that that's like okay. I need to know exactly which camera angle I want to, want it from. I want to know what I want to do in the clip, and I want to like know what they should do as well. And and it, it's not very difficult to to write write that sort of things down. Uh, and but you need to know it. Don't don't just start making clips. It's be pretty much useless in my opinion. So so if you know what you want, you, you can you can get what you want. And when you're prepping. There is there is not such a thing as too many details. Maybe some of the details you added were superfluous, but maybe they were not. And if you have too few things, then the recordings will will be fucked up because you missed some important details, and and then you have to scrap it and redo it. So you can never plan too much. Never try to add too many small details. Uh, if you have, if you have, if you have a, if it's important to have a stand. If you, if you can have a cameraman behind the stand, even better. But a stand, I think, is is very important to not have a shaky camera. Uh, you can probably see in in the videos when when Alex was here because I recorded his workshops and put them up up as well. Uh, so, Half of the recent workshop, it was I recording, and I had like a nasty flu from having been to Spain and, and catching something nasty there. And you can hear me sniffling all, all, all in, in the whole video, and I was shaking and, and stuff. And the, in the year previously, I was all, the, the cameraman was also shaking a lot, and it's very, very annoying. It's better to have a good stand that's not shaking. I mean, if you can afford it, sure, you can get like those super fancy uh non-rotating thing imaging is but but a, a camera stand costs nothing it's extremely cheap to get one and it it, it will improve it, it will improve the, the quality a lot if you have a stand because then it won't shake and this is a mistake i've made more than once and it's it's not a very fun mistake to make Make sure that you're actually in focus of, of the recording. Don't, don't let yourself walk out of it or 
a, a really frustrating one was 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 from the uh, second last one I did, and we recorded, and then it was kind of windy, so it blew over the camera, so it fell over. Then I just put it up and didn't check if it was still looking in the perfect. I was like, yeah, yeah it's probably good enough. Uh, and then I recorded all the rest of the clips, and the camera had been recording the sky, uh, not much of me. So I had to scrap all of that and, and, and redo all of those clips. What if I take in like 10, 20 seconds to, to look at the camera, like check what it was actually looking at after it had fallen over, then I could just readjust it. And I mean, maybe I had to, to, to ask my student to recalibrate it and everything, but it, it takes like a minute. Now I had to redo the whole, the whole process and then I need to schedule a, a new time where we could actually have time to record, et cetera, et cetera. And and this is also go, go also go back and look at your footage as you're recording it, like re watch it immediately. At least I'm, I'm using my my phone as a camera. I bought a I, I bought a camera a phone that was specifically good to making videos with. So I'm using my phone, and I can immediately look at the phone, the footage, how it looks like. I mean, it, it, the, the the clips are not that long. I mean, it's like they're like a minute max. So it, it doesn't take long to at least just very fast like jump through it, and and if I do that, I, I can make sure that I'm okay. Yeah, I didn't walk out of the camera. It, it looked fine. It was fine. Everything is in focus, and because when you are when you are recording the clips, you usually have time for like doing a retake. It's it doesn't take that much time. It's not that 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 which is which is the issue. And do as many takes, same as previously. Do as many takes as, as you need. If if someone fucked up the technique completely, let's redo it. If if you walked out of the camera or did something else stupid, redo it. This doesn't and and this also means you should practice a bit before you're doing it. If if you're trying to show something off, it's do do a few takes so you actually feel comfortable with it. Pretty much everything we've been recording so far has been like drills we've been drilling recently anyways, because it's like rather fundamental drills. So we've been working on the fundamentals and doing his fundamental drills. So the, my students are fam familiar with the drills and can do them reasonable at, at least. Daniel, are you going to talk about uh, location of where you choose to uh, to do your recordings? No, I don't plan to do that, but uh, that's a good question. Uh, the location is it's a difficult one. I generally try to do it where where we practice because it's easy and available. Uh, we have a gym hall when it's not Corona times at least. And that's usually what I record. Right now I do it outdoors, which works fine in the summer because you get really good light, lighting in the summer. Uh, but half the year here, we don't really see the sun, so it's probably not going to work in a, in like four months or so to record outdoors. But otherwise, outdoors is is usually pretty good. Uh, I try to have a background that's not too cluttered with random random things. Uh, but that's usually what I have to. Uh, what I usually ha have to uh, skimp on. I I I I can't be that picky to get the perfect background. Usually, I mean it, it's a gym hall and it's like random gym stuff on the on the walls. So I have to accept that's the case. Uh, I just try to find a wall that's less less full of stuff, but all of them have stuff. So, and, and I try to point the camera in a direction that doesn't have too much stuff when it's outdoor either. I noticed that, 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 that the lighting in a lot of your clips uh, works fine. Like even if you have windows, um, like you're, if they're not doing strange things to everything else that, that we see, right? Um, they're, like a, you don't have like dappled light coming through 
trees or glare coming off of things like that. No. Uh, any thoughts about how you arrange that, or if you're just lucky with the locations that you choose to do? I, I, I'm pretty lucky with, with that, to be honest. Uh, I have the bigger problem I have is get the rough light. Mm. Um, this, I live pretty far, far, far north, so half the year it's it's really dark, and it's prob it, I I don't have that strong lighting at home that I can get like a good lighting. Uh, for, for a camp for the camera, and, and it shows, especially in my earliest videos, but even in my later videos, it's what most common complaint I get is that my that the light sucks. So I try, if I can, to use natural light of, the, of opening the windows and stuff. I don't have weird glares, uh, but I haven't really figured out, out a good way to do it. So I, I guess I'm lucky in that I don't get any weird glares and stuff. Um, but the light is is biggest thing I'm 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 struggling with to be honest. So uh, if I'm doing animations, I don't do animations in every video, but if I'm doing them, you need to to have them really 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 detailed. You need to like have it down to to the frame, more or less, for the for the for the dimensions, um, because they need to line up with with, with the video. And and this is this is like the timings. So I I know when I want want this text to start, when this to end, when I want to move this and that, etc. This is just some, some my way of writing writing it down. And then at the times it doesn't start at zero; they start at 025, which which is which is when the first animation clip was was appearing on the on the screen, and these times are based on timings I take from my from the frame I used earlier. So animations they are extremely time consuming. Uh, the videos I I've, I've made I usually I mean I said earlier that research is what takes the most time research and writing script. It's not true. It's it's animations. Animations takes the most time, to be honest. I don't have them in all my videos, but I have them in a few. I think I made a one video with all of Rada's footwork drills, and I animated all of his all of his images. And it was just a super basic animation, like how, how the feet are moving, and then I made some dots that kind of followed his lines to illustrate that the feet were moving. And I think that took me like 40 hours of work or something like that. Usually I think it's like uh, 30 to 40 hours to make a video, but that video took closer to 80 hours of work. I mean, the research hours, I don't really feel that much because it's, it's like fun to read about the stress and, and writing scripts is like fine. But the animation one, it, it's it's really, really heavy to make animations. I, 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 don't, I don't know how to make animations. I have no clue how to do it, so I'm probably a bit slower. I mean, if, if I'm up to speed on it, I think it could already cut it down to probably a quarter of that, but animations are extremely time consuming. And if possible, I think they should be avoided. But in this case, I felt his footwork, his, foot, his footwork diagrams are kind of confusing. People that look at them the first time get they, they, they don't know what, what, what they're supposed to look at. It's like so many things at once. Like, what the fuck is this? I, I don't know. You need to explain to them like, oh yeah, this is this, this is this. And I felt that if I made, made it animated, just a simple animation for it, it would be much easier. I think that succeeded very well. So I, it, it, was, it wasn't that I felt that I could skip it. In this case, I felt it was needed. So then I did animations. And in hindsight, I would do it too. I, even if it took a lot of time to do, I think it was the, it was the, it was the right choice. You have and, appreciation and, yeah. for them from your audience here. What? You have appreciation for your animations yeah. from the audience here. Yeah, they were saying your animations have been really helpful, so that 40 hours was well spent. Yeah. And and I think they, they, look, they, they can look really, really good. But it looks really neat when you have a good animation. So, so, I mean, the upsides of animation is that, that they can be very pedagogical and they can look really nice. 
So, so I mean, it's, it's a cost benefit. And most of the time, I don't think they're worth it, but a few times I think they're really, really worth it. And then I think I, I think it was worth it to take the time. But when, it, I mean, I've been harping on this, but for animation, it's even more important. You need to know exactly what you want. And it, 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 there is like n no room for, for any details to be lost. You need to know exactly what you want. Down to, to like frames, you need to know like exactly how long should this animation be? Like, what should it show? What should it show when? It needs to be extremely, extremely, extremely detailed, exactly what you want. And, and because it takes so much time, you, can, you don't want to fuck this up. You don't want to fuck up like any of the timings and anything you do, because if you have to redo anything, it takes lots of time. So, so know exactly what you want. Really, 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 really plan ahead when you're doing animations. And 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 re, and and do double takes, do triple takes. Like the, the planning cannot get too much time when you're making animations. And I don't think this can be overstated. I mean, animations is is extremely costly. Spend the time planning them. And you also need to prepare the, this is like the first step when you're doing an animation. You need to prepare the images so they can be animated. And the process I did was more or less, uh, Johanna, can you ma make these images for me? And then she would complain a lot and, and then make the videos of, of these random half-naked dudes walking on, on a weird circle while she was complaining quite a lot because she did not en enjoy drawing these images. And, and she broke them up into layers and then I could, uh, uh, like hide, hide, hide the parts of, of of the feet and how the circles are moving and everything. So the first step is like the preparation of the image, but you need an image first that you can actually animate. We have a question about the software that you're using for animation. Uh, I'm using After Effects. I mean, this is also a good side effect of having a, an artist girlfriend. Uh, I have access to Pretty good software. Uh, I use After Effects for the animations, and I use Sony Vegas for uh, the video editing, and then I use GIMP for for making uh, images. And she uses uh, Photoshop and. I don't remember what the other one was called that uses those, those, those vectors. Illustrator, I think. Yeah. Oh shit, I forgot the last one. But yeah, uh, it's important that you make that you don't make them too complicated either. As I said, it was, they are they are expensive, so don't try to make something super fancy because it will take lots and lots of time. I mean, I made super simple ones, and it still took lots of time. If I, if I try to make something very, very fancy, because I was thinking, about, well, yeah, maybe I should animate the, the dudes when I'm doing Radha's cutting drills. Yeah, maybe I should animate the dudes and make them move and everything. Like, nah, no, don't do that. It's, gonna, it's, it's not going to be worth the time you're spending. The final step of making the videos is, is the, like the editing of it. And I usually edit continuously. Like I, I made some editing when I made a framework. If I finish a clip, I will edit and add it. Because and I already made all the framework and like the details of what I want where. So I, it's, it's, I, I can do it continuously without a problem, really. That's also an advantage of having done a very meticulous plan. It's easy to just jump in and do a bit of it here and there because you're, you're, you already know what, what, where everything is going. And it, in this phase, I usually also make the splash screens, like uh, I had in, images in between the drills or something like that, or the, or, the, or the conclusion text that like explain what we did in the video. The thumbnail, it's not me that does the thumbnail either, it's Johanna that have made the thumbnail for me. But it, it is like the, when the video is fi fi finishing up, it's usually when, when she does that. Uh, would be when I would be making them myself as well. And like the, the last cuts, is, this is the time when I'm doing it, like cutting it and making sure that it fits with the clips and like 
I can change things here and there in the editing. And usually, as, as I said, this is a continuous process. Uh, I don't really do them exactly in this order, but because the editing, I do a little, a little bit here and there. But the rest is usually I make a script, I make a framework, I make the clips and animations, and then I do the fin finishing touches. That's usually the order of how I make things. And this is also the last time I can actually look look at the video before people get to see it. Usually, after I'm finished with the video, I post it as unlisted, and then I send it to some people to like get a look that I don't say anything completely stupid. I mean, it's it's I probably won't be able to make any large changes, but if it's something that's really big, that's like oh you said this and this is completely wrong, I I can always go back and redo the video at that point. If if it if it's necessary, that's like the last time to to pull the brakes on the video. And if it's like something small, I can always add like a subtitle that that adds it or like post it on on the screen or something like that. And yeah, this yeah lots of round of feedback. So that's my process. Any questions? So um, we have a fencing question, um, not not, but I'm going to ask people to go ahead and put their questions in the chat, and we'll pick those up. Um, so um, one of the audience members says uh, they wanted to thank you for providing the resource to the community. And the question is, could you elaborate on uh, getting offline from your higher stance while under pressure? Um, so he's placing some context on this. You have lost the, ten the distance and tempo game and you need to reset when your weapon can't protect you at the moment. And your opponent is either started or about to start a lunge against you from the low guard, um, like the Italian style low guards. So um, just to circle back to the original question, um, Getting offline uh, from a high stance uh, under pressure. The low guards in general are are probably the trickiest. I think I think to deal with. Uh, there is lots of wrong answers when dealing with them, and and you can easily be fooled by it. And if it Generally, I don't want to be in in a uh, in a in a typical right angle if I'm facing a low guard. I think it was De La Vega who 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 has his high he has a high guard when he's like pointing his point downwards towards the hand of the opponent. I think it's, it's him that has it, and Rada has his virtual atajo with with his with his hilt high and his point low. Uh, but making the steps. I mean, I don't make them any different if I'm pressured or not. Uh, I think the key, but the key is if, if you're expecting someone to launch at you and, and you want to buy time, uh, you don't need them to do them forward. You can do them backwards as well. You can move, you can move diagonally backwards. And that usually gives you a little bit extra time. But otherwise, it's... I mean, it's this, it's the same footwork you always be doing, and you will be pushing with your with your rear leg in the in the motion and lifting your front leg in, in the motion. So if I'm moving to the right, I will be pushing with my left foot and lifting my right foot, and, and vice versa if I'm moving to the to the left. Uh, you can also like put your rear leg behind your front leg. Uh, as, 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 as if, if, if you're really, really short on time, like pivot on, on your foot and just do, I think, I think it's Maya who calls it, like a triangle step or something like that. Um, but it's like a pivot on your front foot. So let me ask you um, a follow-up question, which may um, help me put this into context a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you fence in an upright posture or do you fence at a low posture uh, when using this reservoir? Because we get different reads on that. And uh, I usually have a high stance. And um, with that higher center of gravity, 
um, because you you fence Depe for a long time, which is I, I yes. typically a pretty low stance. Um, what uh, what changes did you make so that you felt like you could move effectively? Because you you talked earlier about how footwork was really fundamental, and you struggled yes. to kind of tune it. So maybe maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, FB is everything between high and low stance. My stance in FB was never super low. It was not. It wasn't as high as my the stress I see there, it was somewhere in between. It was a middle stance. Uh, with working in a high stance, uh, I felt it was a necessity, to be honest, uh, to work off to work offline. Because I, I feel if, if if my feet was too far too far apart, it's it's much harder for them to step to the sides. Well, if, I, if my feet are closer together, it's much easier to, to have the mobility of the feet in all directions. And with a high stance, I, I'm not sure, are you referring to to the feet or to the, like the, the body or to the sword? I'm just referring to the body. Um, so there's also the question of, like, do you use a uh, right angle? Or, or do you use something uh, modified? But I, I'm, I think we're more interested right now in just uh, getting that movement. Uh, yeah. Uh, then I'm definitely in a high stance. Uh, and yeah, I, I mostly feel the mobility is the biggest thing I get from being so high, that I can step in any direction. If you're really low, uh, you will, like, if you lift the front foot, you'll kind of naturally fall in like almost immediately, you, you, you cannot balance with one leg in the, in the air. Because, because you, your, your, uh, your center of gravity is like in between your feet then. And if you lift one foot, well, you're going to fall in that direction. Well, if you had your feet very close together, they will be, they will, the, the center of gravity will either be right on your foot or right, right next to your foot. Your foot. And you can like lean back a little bit, and then then you, you can just stand on one leg, like no problem. And and it means that it's easier for for you also to move in all directions. I feel, uh, and I felt that if I had a too low stance, it was hard for me to move offline. So I feel it's much much easier when I'm when I'm having a fairly high stance. I mean, I I don't have my feet completely together. I think they are like. A foot apart or something like that, mm -hmm. and and my knees are slightly bent, just slightly, and enough for me to 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 actually work with my knees, but not so much that I'm becoming super tall. Right, not like Frankenstein's monster. No, 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 no. no. I don't want to lock my knees. Right. Um. So, uh, more questions are coming in, and um. Let's see. Um, would like to get your take on using uh, true school distressa principles for fencing against Italian style. I feel it's it's something that's um, it's odd at first, and it feels kind of awkward because they're doing lots of things that will completely break your fencing. And you will do lots of things that are wrong. There is like lots and lots and lots of wrong answers when you're facing the Italians. Uh, but there are right answers also, I feel. And I don't feel that the matchup is tilted any direction, to be honest. I fenced some pretty good Italians, and I, I felt I could hold my ground. Uh, and I think. Some of the key, it depends also like where, how they're holding the sword and what strategy that they're, they're fencing with. Like if, if they're doing absence of blade, absence of blade is, is really horrible to fence against. If they're like super retreaty, also very horrible to fence against. There's like barely any good answers to, to an opponent that keeps retreating. If you have infinite ground of, of, to retreat on, you're not going to hit them ever. And it's, 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 it's kind of frustrating to fence against. If, if the ground is limited, you can always eat up the ground, like take your time, eat, eat, eat ground. Eventually, they will, they, you will have them in a corner then, and then you, they, they will actually have to do some fencing and not just running. 
So, so I mean, that's how we deal with retreats, in my opinion. And but I think the key, if someone is retreating a lot, is to not push too hard. If you're pushing too too fast and too far and too straight, this is like the time when they can catch you out. They they are probably looking for temples. That's like their view of fencing. They will be looking for temples on you, and like. Every time you take a step, you're doing a temp you're giving them a tempo. And if it's a long tempo, they probably will be able to, to hit you. And the, and if if you're stepping straight towards them, it's easier for them to find a weakness in your distancing. Well if you're if you're stepping slightly offline uh, to the sides and like walking towards them but walking on the circle, it's much harder for them to actually engage on you. And if you do it with like not tiny steps, but like fairly small steps, there will be very little for them to actually engage on. And they're, they're waiting for you. They're waiting for you to make, to fuck up. Uh, I think it's a really interesting point um, that the Italian wants to, to trigger that tempo to hit you with the explosive lunge. And I, th I think what you're saying is that by opening up degrees of profile, you force that Italian fencer to adjust in ways that they're not that that's going to prevent them from hitting you with that lunge. Is that what I'm getting? Mm, the point with, I didn't really get into that part yet, but my point was rather that if you step closer to them, if you step straight, if they move straight, then, then you will have eaten a lot of distance. And this means that the distance will be very off and they will probably be able to hit you. If I step to the right or if I step to the left, they need to step exactly correctly right then to do it well if they if, if we're stepping straight it's much more likely they will step the perfect step that will mismatch badly for me well if you're stepping offline you it will be it's harder to do the correct uh inverse of my step so to say well, if I'm yeah. stepping straight, it's easier because the, the inverse of my step is a straight step as well, or, or a retreat, depending on what they want to achieve. But in general, I think, yes, also, also uh, uh, taking the degrees of the profile, like moving towards them, uh, is the right way to approach them. They will make a straight attack towards you, an explosive straight attack. The best way to avoid it is to walk to the, to the sides. And if I if I move backwards, they will if, if they will often make an explosive enough movement that they will still hit you with it. I mean, you can retreat out of it completely, but then you're kind of fencing their game. That's not really what you want to do. You want to get closer to them without them being able to hit, hit you with their missile. Because that's more or less what, what they're doing. They're, they're, they're shooting one shot from maximum distance, and it's going to be a really, really fast hitting one. And if it hits, yes, it sucks to be you. But if they don't hit it, that's like the biggest opening you have on them. You don't want to retreat out of that opening. Because if you do, then, then it's reset, and then, it, then they're going to do the same thing again. If you instead move to the side, the, their motion will, will pass on, on your side, and then you're, you're being, being, are closer to them. When you're closer to them, that's your game. They, 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 save, they suck at cutting, they suck at conclusions, they, they, they're not very good at bind work. That's like my experience of Italian fencers. They're very, very good on one thing. They're very good at hitting the lunges, and they're good at hitting the lunges with, in, in, with an, in an attack in opposition. If you can get them to the, the cut and thrust game, and like adding the grappling stuff, that's usually not what they practice on. They will have much bigger problems there. And that's like the part where the stretta really shines. That's like a big part of the fencing. It's like the shift between the cuts and the thrusts all the time. That's like the core of, of the destreza. And if you can do that, and like the, the perpetual attacking, like my, my every attack I do leads to a parry from their side. And each parry they do means they don't attack me. So I can do another attack and another attack and another attack. That's like... How 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 where this stress is really really strong, but it happened from a closer distance. Mm -hmm. So so if you just retreat out, you're not gonna you're not gonna get to your distance. You're gonna play their game, and they, then they will win because they're playing their game. You want to play your game, and your game is is slightly closer than their game. And the best time to actually get there is them doing a lunge that didn't hit you. That's like the perfect opportunity. 
for, so for your really, goal. Yeah, I, well, I just really like the way that you're, you've delved into this topic a little bit. And it, it goes back to that original question um, where it, it was asking about what happens if you get caught flat-footed uh, with a lunge. And it sounds like your answer is to develop the ability to move off the line rather than backwards. And that, yes. that high yes. stance is what, what facilitates that. Yes. Uh, the, the second thing is that you need to be able to defend against their lunges. And you don't want to defend the lunge when it's coming. You want to have defended against it before it happens. You want to have close their the main lines of attack already. And this is like the whole point of the virtual attack. You, you want to close off their, their possibilities of attacking so you can safely step. And when you're safely stepping, they, and while, while being covered, they can't do a direct attack to you. To you, they, they, they can still do an indirect attack to, to another opening. But them doing an indirect attack means you have time to react. And this also gets into the next part because they will not have a direct line of opening to you. You will make small steps. So you're not taking. So you're not giving them a bunch of bunch of tempos they can abuse. And you're you're kind of covered. This this is extremely frustrating for an Italian fencer. They're looking for tempos. They're looking for mistakes. They're looking for for that big lunge they're gonna hit on you. And, and you, if if you're slowly eating distance on them with small circular steps, while while, while covering the main line of attack, it's it's not very easy for them to to engage on you. It, it's it's incredibly frustrating for them. And and I. I fenced Italian fencers who, who, who were extremely frustrated at the fencing. They were like, what are you doing? You're, you're doing some stupid random style. I'm not used to that shit. Well, it, it's almost, it was almost like I was cheating against them. It, it, it sounded when we were, were talking just by covering my lines and then stepping closer to them because that was not the game they were used to. Did you tell them that Rada sends them a happy Christmas? <laughs> Yeah, no, I didn't have any good one-liner, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so uh, another question from the audience. Um, what got you into RADA, or uh, maybe rephrased, of all the different uh, Destreza masters out there, what, what, um, what got you onto RADA specifically? And mm -hmm. uh, do you think that RADA is better explaining, footwork, uh, explaining his footwork than some of the other authors? I mean, what got me into the stress sign in the first place was Alex, and I mean, he, he, he is the Rada missionary. He was knocking on my door like, have you heard of, of our Lord and Savior, Rada? And I mean, that's how I got into it. But it's, it's not why, why I stuck with Rada. And, and the thing that made me stuck, stick with Rada was, was, was his footwork drills. It was his drills. I mean, it is fairly unique among pretty much all sources. I mean, you don't, you don't see drills in many sources at all. So like this level of drills, like explaining the footwares in detail with like, here's how you step. I mean, you can see it in like 19th century saber sources. They have that, they have it, but like rapier sources, like no, anything earlier, no. It's extremely rare and, and they are, very, very, very high quality. I mean, they hold up to today. Like a modern book could could have his drills. That that's how good his drills are. And I think yes, he's the best to explain his footwork for that reason. And and there is like he has no competition of of everything I've read, seen and read. But I mean, there is like so many distress authors I haven't read. I mean, I have Manuel Balia's book about. Uh, his bibliography of the stress and it's like I don't know it's 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 silly how thick that book is it's got at least seven books in it yeah yeah it does it's like a, I think I think I think it's like 700 entries or something like that oh, yeah yes different the stress of books and I mean sure I, I knew uh, like the, the, the famous ones but like even even like the golden age of of, of, of the stress I was I think it's still like a hundred books or something. I, I, I don't know all those books. Maybe there are a book there that's like just as good as Rada or even better than Rada, but I, from all I've seen, he's like the pinnacle of footwork. 
and explaining it. And and this is like the main thing you get from Rada, I think. It's it's it's, it's this extremely detailed description of things and especially the fundamentals. And I think that's the key to any fan thing. You need to understand the fundamentals. That's like what you should be spending most of your time with. It's, it's drilling the damn footwork. It's doing the basic cuts. It's doing the basic attacks. This is what, like what you should be spending like most of your time with because it's what you're gonna do most of the time. Like every fencing match, I'm gonna do a, a normal step, whatever the normal step is, and I'm gonna do it a lot. So, so, so if I can shave off like a half or a percent in efficiency, efficiency on that one step, it's gonna be worth like hundreds of percents on, on, on my super advanced uh, third intention attacks. Like, sure, it's super fancy to do those, but it's the, st it's the basics that I will be doing all the time. So we have a question from somebody in the audience. Um, the people that he works with complain that he over explains things, which I think is something that can happen to a lot of distressed people. Um, what What's your take on that? How do you handle that? Because there's so much content, uh, so much detail. Yeah, uh, I do it too. I get into long tangents that are completely unrelated to whatever class I'm doing. And then I spent like 10 minutes there. It's a very common problem I'm having. Uh, on the other hand, I, yes, the stress is very theoretical. I don't think there is time during my classes to really talk about the theory. I mean, I don't have that many hours per week with my students to do to teach them. I, I only have one once per week. It's it's there is no time for theory. It's simple as that. So my my approach right now is I use very sparingly any any uh, terminology even. I use very very little. I, I mean, I, I use the Taho, I use the names of the cuts. I mean, I mention them by their names. And then I often use like a translation, translated name of them. I mention the medios, but that's about it. I don't really go into down, down to the nitty gritty details, like the names of all the, vert, all the vertical planes and uh, all the rotation, rotational planes and whatever. I don't really explain the, the vector system or, or any of the other stuff because there is no time for it really. So, so what I do is generally I just do do the drills, teach the teach the fencing, a very very scaled down theoretical part of it. I, I explain the theory when it's necessary for the fencing, not not otherwise. Um, and I try to avoid going on tangents because, I mean, I have two hours per week. Those hours are worth. I mean, they're invaluable. I can't spend them going on rambling rants about Italians or whatever else I might ramble on about. They need to be to the point, and I need to give my my students as many repetitions as possible. This is how you learn. You do repetitions, lots of repetitions, and. And to get the repetitions, well, I, I need to stop talking. I, I can't be talking. If I'm talking, they, they don't get any repetitions. So I try to focus on that instead, like try to, to, to get them to do as much as possible actual fencing, because that's what, what they will learn from. That's, that's good, thanks. Um, it's sort of a tradition to ask our speakers to talk about the acometimiento. Um, do you have thoughts about it? Mm. I have a very practical approach to acometimiento. I see it simply as a, as a thrust that got parried. It means that if I'm fencing and I do a thrust, if it got parried, then, it, then it's an acometimiento. If, 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 if it didn't get parried, I, then it was a thrust of first intention. I don't really treat it any differently. Like, uh, I don't do a, a special technique that's acometimiento. I don't think it's... It, from, from how Rada uses this, it... I mean, he has a definition, but I don't feel how he uses it when he talks about it in his plays and similar, that it is a 
different technique in, in anything. It's 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 more or less just a thrust that got parried. It's it's just a name for for this thrust got parried. It's good. Thank you for humoring us on that question. Um, so it's uh, eight o'clock. Um, I just want to see if we have more questions for our speaker. I actually have some qu another uh, question too for you, Daniel. So you spent uh, time both teaching in the classroom and making these videos and online, uh, on um, the Facebook conversation areas, like the straight from the SCA and the sets out. What do you think is a is a good mix for uh, teachers on one hand or researchers on one hand to effectively disseminate information and help uh, people learn? And on the other side of that, for students to go to, like how much time in class versus places on the internet or videos? What, what thoughts do you have about that? What does disseminate mean? Does it mean spreading? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in general, I don't think Facebook is a very good place to spread information on. Uh, I don't think Reddit is either. I think, I mean, that's one of the main reasons you should be making videos, if anything, because it's a very efficient way to spread the information. It takes some time to make a video, but then you just need to post it. Uh, all over the place. If if you want to like teach people, I'm not sure if if going down in, into the into the pits to discuss things with 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 singular person people on Facebook or YouTube comments or Reddit comments or Discords or whatever is that efficient. I feel it's in, it's pretty good for me when I'm talking to other people that I can learn from, though. As a student, I think it's extremely useful to be on pretty much any. And, and the important part is mostly that it, they have a... Uh, the, that the discussion holds a, a good good standard, that people are not too mean and doesn't get too angry. I generally prefer Discord right now. It's my, my favorite place to discuss things at. Because I think in general, when you're talking on, in a chat, people are usually more polite. Because it feels more like a human you're talking to. While Facebook, kind of, it, people become assholes on, on, on Facebook, me included, in general. I think it's easier to forget it's a person you talk to. And this is the same that happens in most other places. But, but if you're talking in a chat room, it feels like a person you're talking to to a bigger degree at least. So I feel in general it they chat rooms tend to have a better tone. But on the other hand, like nothing is, is left for the future in a chat room. So uh, if if you have a really good discussion, you need to be saved down in some other way. But generally when I'm doing like my research part, I usually have them fairly open with, with Alish. Like we we're, we're doing back and forth and probably in the in the in the distress, right now I'm doing in, in the distress, uh, uh, distress of Discord on the, on the in the Rada channel. Usually, that's usually where when when I'm like trying to figure things out as I'm doing research. That's usually what happened right now. I had them in in the, the distress channel of the Hema Discord before and using Messenger and like on Reddit as well. But right now, that's where I'm usually talking with. And it's, and it's an open discussion, so anyone could, could, could join and, and, and view it or whatever. But I just think it's an easy way to, to talk to people. Yeah, thanks. So uh, we have posted a link to the Discord server, uh, which you are uh, very active on talking about RADA. Um, Let's see if we have any more questions. If not, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. We have one comment uh, from Tim Rivera about the Discord server. It says that the uh, Discord server is very pleasant, which is very strange for Distressa. We should be like we should cultivate a good fight and some some different camps, which we can have. Uh, like then we can swear that the other people are 
uh, false masters. Yeah, I think the stress is pretty good for that. Uh, there, there are some camps and some camps that get, get along better than others. But yeah, I think for now that the stress Discord has pretty, pretty good tone. We have another uh, question here. Um, as a content creator, is there a specific aspect of Distresa that you wish more people would create content on? Yes. Uh, you might guess it, but it's footwork. I think footwork is, is the key. I think in general, there is too little content on footwork overall in HEMA. Or, like people don't talk enough about footwork and the advanced footwork, like the combinations of, of, of footwork. Because footwork, can, you can get it to an extremely high level. Uh, and usually with footwork, it means that you're doing combinations of fundamentals. Because, I mean, you're just stepping with your foot. It's not, not that, you can, you can step in a few different ways, but it's not that many. Usually the advanced stuff is combinations of stuff and com how you're using your body and momentum and stuff. And there is very, very little about that. And and I think that is something I would want to see more about, like more people that talks about footwork. So I have a question for you. Um, some um, so within Europe, uh, there's sort of a discussion going on about how close you can get to the source texts. Um, can I fence as they did, or is it impossible? Uh, and what what am I willing to change from the source texts in order to be effective in competition? And one of the things um, that I perceive about uh, both you and Alish about the way that you fence is that you, uh, you you tie yourselves pretty closely to the texts. Is that correct? And uh, and my guess on that, and can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I f feel it's completely possible to fence according to the text. I mean, sure, things are a little bit different, I mean, we, we have, I don't remember what it is Alberto says, that we have, we have gym shoes and uh, gym floors or whatever. I don't remember what, it is, is he, what he's usually saying and, and that's how he, he talks about uh, that it is a completely different context, so we need to change our fencing. Uh, but I don't feel it's that different. I mean, fencing is fencing. Things haven't changed that much. I mean, the swords I'm using are very similar to Radas. I mean, I, I'm using the uh, Academia swords that Ferrum, I don't remember, uh, Pilo Berradero and Bellatore, I think they split up into, are making. And, and I think Ton had been involved in it and based them on, on Radas replica, replicas from Radas, or, or at least ex, uh, like the dimensions based on Radas. So I mean, using a sword that's very similar to what Rada used. I feel the fencing itself, why, why should it be changed? I mean, I don't think there's any reason why it should be. And Radha's explanations for everything is extremely detailed. He will tell you how you should rotate your hand, how you should step, how you should move your sword, arm, and everything. I don't see any reason why I shouldn't be able to replicate his fencing. And I don't think, I think it's a bit arrogant to, to think that I can do something better than what he did. I mean, I, I don't live in the golden age of the of the rapier. I don't think any of the modern masters are at the level of of the old masters because they 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 lived in in a completely different time and they were doing this much 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 more than anyone is doing today. I think their answers were probably better than our than than our answers. So I I kind of try to trust them on what they're saying and usually. Well, at least when it comes to Rada, he has, has answers on almost everything. And I mean, there are things that he struggled with himself, and it's pretty obvious. In, in And especially when it comes to the Italians, it's like the, the classic problem of all the Distressa masters, how to deal with the, these Italians. And he, his answers there is, is a bit weird sometimes, but in general, I, I feel he has, has the answers for everything. I don't see a reason why I should make my own new, new modern style instead of just doing his style. And, I, uh, and he has enough explanations that I think I should be able to replicate what it, what it does. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I noticed about um, 
the way that you talk about the system, about Destreza in general. Uh, and I really appreciate that because I've seen you on the internet um, talk to some people who were fairly well established in the community and um, advocate on behalf of the text and the, the original authors, which I thought was, it was a really fresh voice uh, and, and arguing for things that uh, against people that um, had already been established. I just appreciated the way that you had done that. Um, all right, um, let's see if there are any more questions. We have kept you up super late and I, I have really enjoyed your lecture. It's really interesting and a really fresh topic because I don't think anybody has talked about anything like this, but it's super useful um, right now, especially with everyone trapped at home. Um, like anybody that could get out and make a video based on what you had done. I hope you send uh, Daniel a note of thanks for all this input. Um, and thank you for staying up so late and lending your time and expertise and talent to us uh, for this uh, lecture. Any last questions? No, just a lot of thank yous in the chat. All right, thank you very much, Daniel. And next week, uh, we're gonna have Ryan Neal and he's gonna be talking about um, Spanish common school. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks for having me, it was, it was great. It's, it's an honor to be here. Pleasure to have you, Daniel. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.